But it's always a pleasure to be back here and to celebrate the spirit of independence. And over the years we've had, you know, discussed quite a few issues related to independence and we've interviewed, we've had some fantastic guests and today, this year, we also have, I think, a fantastic program. Um, I wanted to especially thank uh, Midem and Virginie Sauter uh, for putting this panel together alongside uh, Martin Goldsmith from Cooking Vinyl in the UK, who was acting on behalf of AIM and Impala to help us identify the topics and the speakers. And I think that uh, Martin did a pretty good job. And uh, this morning he was telling me, after all, it wasn't that much of a hard work. So, uh, Martin, uh, thank you very much. We'll probably do it again <laughs> next year. So, uh, what can we say about independent uh, labels these days? Well, there seem to be still quite a lot of independent labels. But the interesting things, uh, thing also is that there seem to be also some new independent labels. So, why are people you know, launching labels in these times of, I think, uh, you know, we call challenging. Uh, who are these crazy people and, uh, you know, what uh, are they looking for? Are they looking, uh, do they want to be rich? Do they want to be famous? Do they want to mingle with great artists? What are all these reasons? Uh, we'll discuss that during the second half of um, this Indie Summit uh, on a panel which, uh, with a panel that will regroup some people that have been crazy enough to launch a label in the past decade. Uh, but before we get there, um, I'd like to mention the name of someone uh, who is probably f familiar with you, and it's a French, uh, French uh, entrepreneur named Francis Dreyfus. He died last year and he was, uh, I think he embodied the spirit of independence. He, uh, in the early 70s, started you know, building up a fantastic publishing catalog and also signed a young musician called Jean-Michel Jarre, and the two together ended up selling, you know, 50 to 60 million records around the world uh, and out of a small office in, in Paris. Uh, Francis was a gentleman. Franc he was a great inspirer, and also he was one of the founding fathers of the French independent organization, UPFI. And I think uh, if we can put uh, our, you know, summit this year under the spirit of someone, it should be under the spirit of Francis. Uh, he, um, uh, I think, would have liked to be here to discuss the topics that we're going to be talking about. Um, our first session uh, is dedicated to two uh, exceptional uh, entrepreneurs who also embody the independent spirit. They come from two different parts of the world, one from England, the other one from uh, the US. They have a probably completely different business model, but what one thing that you know links them is that they are fiercely independent. Uh, and so I would like you to give a warm welcome to Glenn Barros from the Concord Music Group and Daniel Miller from Mute Records. So. Glenn Barros runs Concord, uh, the Concord Music Group, which is based in Los Angeles, um, and is uh, one of the biggest indies in the U.S., which has grown. Uh, you joined the, the company in '95, and uh, one of the main area of growth was through acquisition and the aggregation of amazing catalogs. Uh, from Fantasy to Telerk to Stax, Prestige, Pablo, and uh, more recently you've done a joint venture with Starbucks called Hear Music, um, which has released albums from the likes of Paul McCartney, Johnny Mitchell, James Taylor, and a few others. Um, <coughs> Daniel Miller, I don't think we need to introduce you, do we? Um, started in 1978, uh, DJ, musician, and started issuing some records and ended up running a label and eventually signing, actually not signing because uh, apparently there was no contract, a, a, a small band called Depeche Mode which ended up being you know, one of the biggest 
sensation. After in the 2003-2004, uh, Daniel sold his company to EMI for a reported 23 million pounds. So I don't know if th that's what he has in the on his bank account. Um, but last year, uh, news came that actually Daniel was a, um, a born-again indie in that he had regained his independence from EMI. But I think all the way through, you kept uh, with EMI your independent spirit, right? Try to. Try to. Um, my first question to, to you is, is it a good time to be an independent? Uh, yeah. I don't know if it's a good time to be a record company, mm -hmm. but if you're going to be a record company, I think it's a pretty good idea to be an independent. But you could have retired. You could have said, okay, fine. Why should I continue? What drives you? I enjoy it. I enjoy, I, I enjoy bringing music to the public to see their reaction and hopefully have an impact on their lives in the way that music had on me when I was starting out. And I still get satisfaction from that and in a lot of enjoyment. Glenn, same for you. Are you enjoying it? Oh, I'm, I'm very much enjoying it. Um, and I think it's a great time to be an independent. I think um, clearly music's going to be around uh, forever and uh, businesses will exist based on music. And I think how it progresses is going to be uh, determined by those who are very flexible and experimental and entrepreneurial. So I think it's a wonderful time to be uh, an independent and, and we're certainly having a very good time despite all of the challenges that we face in the industry right now. So, Daniel, with your, your new setup, your, you have uh, your own company now, your own offices, about 15 people working for the company. Uh, what, what is your main focus at the moment uh, to keep the, the label going? Well, I th the, the focus is always the same, is really to, to work with artists who you know, try and build a long-term career with really great artists who, who make great records. Mm -hmm. We're fortunate enough to be able to continue to work with some of our artists who we've worked with for many years. And um, then, you know, we've, when we're also signing new artists as well. So, mm -hmm. and it's very exciting because, you know, we're, we're starting, even though the label isn't new, um, because a lot of the artists came across, a lot of the people came across, the company's completely new. And so that gives us a great opportunity to really start from scratch and figure out what the right thing to do is to go forward rather than having to, to sort of change existing mm -hmm. structures. So it's nice to start with a fresh structure. But compared to when you started in 78, what's the main difference? It's probably 30 years of experience? God, I don't know. It's just so many changes that it's almost impossible. I mean, you know, when I started, you could put out a seven inch single, you'd, you'd, you'd give out five promotional copies and uh, you could sell uh, 30,000 of those mm -hmm. seven inch singles without really trying too hard if it was good. And that was one, that's one thing. Um, there are very few outlets. You know, it was the beginning of a new generation of independent distribution, which was really started by Rough Trade and then forming a distribution network in the UK with different record shops and beginning a very important um, phase in, in the development of independent music, in the, certainly in the UK. Mm -hmm. And so all those things were new. Um, the, there, was, there were very few gatekeepers in those days. Uh, you know, we had four in England. I'm, I'm just talking about the UK, really. We had four music takers and basically one DJ <laughs> who would play your music, who was John Peel. And nobody else at Radio One was, was going to play your music. So that's why you needed five promo copies. But if, they didn't, if none of those people liked your record, you were pretty stuck because there was no way of exposing your music other than through those five people. If they did like it, you were very lucky. So now there's no gatekeepers. You know, it's like the, the, the floodgates have opened, the gates have opened, really. And so to expose your music now is, is, is very, it's easy to get through the gate. Now then you have to get to the people, you have to get to the people who are behind the gate to, to actually listen to it. But I mean, you, you have an opportunity now that you never had in those days, which is to, to reach uh, the world without, without anybody really standing in your way. But it must be quite um, daunting every morning to wake up and say, I don't have, for example, a big back catalog to rely on. I don't have uh, a, a major group. Be how am I going to make you know meet the the target, the figures, just to pay the salaries of my fifteen employees, and and also the royalties for my artists? 
Well, to be honest with you, I don't. I try to avoid thinking about those things when I wake up, because <laughs> I don't think. I think I would go straight back to sleep if I was uh, if I was thinking about too much of those things. No, we don't. We do. We have a catalogue, though. We do have catalogue. We have quite a lot of our old catalogue, which we licensed back from EMI. So that's that's a very important part of our, us going forward. You know, we have a publishing company. We have a record company. Obviously, the deals we're doing now are much broader in terms of the the income streams and all. The artists that we work with understand why that needs to be. Um, we're also working in, in management as well. So there's, we've got opportunities for making for, for making money outside the tradition, just the traditional records. But I do believe that peop if you, not to the same extent as before, but if you make great records over a long period of time with artists, people will want to buy into that, and the people will be actually pre be prepared to pay for that because they want to be part of that a part of the a part of that life. But it, it almost sounds like a 1960s ethos. Um, s you know, stick uh, to your artists as long as possible, and eventually it will work. Well, it doesn't always work. Mm. But I mean, if you and you have to, re you know, one of the difficult, most difficult things is to actually realize when it's not working, and the, when you have to end a relationship, which you not, wouldn't necessarily like to, but you sometimes you have to. But I don't know if that's a 60s ethos. I mean, I don't know. It's just a way of working. That's all. I mean. Um, I think I think that it, for me that's a lot of it's about what you know what what work make works for me as a, as the owner of a company to make me want to do it I guess and that's what gives me the most satisfaction is working with an artist over five six seven albums watching them develop giving them the creative space to develop and hopefully you know, hopefully that works and you know that's incredibly satisfying. Glenn, your business model is slightly different in the sense that you have a lot of catalogue and that's probably the main source of revenue for the group or no it's it's about 50 50 mm -hmm. i mean half half of our revenue comes from our catalogue and you know we've been very fortunate to not only develop great catalogue but to um to buy some a uh, few companies along the way that have amazing catalogues you mentioned some of them earlier when we we bought fantasy um about six years ago and uh fantasy of course had all those you know incredible labels of stacks and all the jazz labels and all. So yes, yeah, so catalogs, you know, a very important part of our business. But uh, we also have three active label groups uh, that work in different genres and uh, about the relationships across all those labels with over 150 artists. So we're very active in um, in the recording side of things. One of the, the the issues that we we find these days, and and I think Daniel mentioned that, is that there's many avenues to promote. And but the marketing budgets have not been have not expanded because the return on investment seems to be lower, um, and it's even more difficult for for uh, for independent labels. How do you navigate through you know the in the current ecosystem? How do you how can you get to the consumer? How do you have any uh, um, you know? Someone <laughs> told me that you. You know, Concord is is renowned for actually being very tight on its on on its costs and and uh, really checking every single expense. Is that the is that the key to the success? I wouldn't say that's the key to the success, but I'd say it's it's good sense to be you know to to question everything you're doing and make sure it makes um, you know the most sense. I mean, clearly it's become very difficult to uh, to to reach uh, your customer because I think um, Daniel mentioned it. Um, using the word gatekeeper. I've, I've used the word editor um, in that we, we've lost the editors, the people that take um, all of this uh, music that's available and put it into something that's manageable um, for, for the ultimate uh, customer. And so when we look at it, you know, we think that many of the old tools that used to work uh, no longer work because the, the, they're, it's been so fragmented. There are so many different editors or no editors at all. And so um, when we look at it, you know, just to, to spend money because it's the way we've always done things, even though you're seeing less and less impact, is just, it's foolish. Um, so let's put our energy, whether it's our human energy or our financial energy, into things that we know will have an impact or into ways where we know we can connect with a fan um, and therefore achieve success both, you know, for, for the customer and for our artist. Daniel, are you... Uh, do you, how do you reach out? I mean, it depends on the artist. I mean, if you have a long, you know, if you have an established artist, or if you have a new artist, it's very, very different. If you have an established artist, hopefully you have lots of ways to know who they are, the, the fan base is. You can connect in lots of different ways to them. You know, 
as you say, the, the budgets are, 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 are going seriously down, but I think that's fine because the kind of ways that you need to communicate with people has changed completely and it isn't expensive. You know, you, you know, on a certain artist, big artist, you might splash out and do a big video, but that's becoming more and more infrequent. But, you know, or, or spend money on, you know, postering, you know, huge posters or whatever the expense, or TV advertising, whatever the expensive um, ways of marketing are to reach a certain kind of audience. But for most artists, the, that costs have come right down on marketing. And that's, a, you know, it's more about the, the costs are more in the human resource of the skill of the people who are doing it rather than the sort of physical, physical marketing that we used to do in the old days, you know. How do you deal with the digital environment, uh, which did not exist when you started? Uh, is it a question of uh, aggregating talent and skills within <coughs> your teams, or do you outsource that? It's a mixture of both, really, for us. Again, it, it, everything is very much customized to, a to, a, to the project. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we do everything in-house, sometimes we bring in resources from outside. It's a whole, it's a whole mixture. We don't have any, you know, as I said, you know, at the beginning, you know, we're just starting a new company and we're figuring out what the best ways are for moving forward. But right now we're using both in-house and people from outside as well. Okay, on the, the digital side? Yeah, I, I, I echo the mm -hmm. thought that, you know, every project is different. So every project has its own, its own mix and uh, we have a staff of people that do that day in, day out, but we supplement that with, uh, with people that we'll bring on that are dependent on whatever the project's particulars are and how best to, to reach its audience. Um, one thing that also links you is that you both have a relationship with major companies, so it's not necessarily uh, you against them. You know, you you use their strengths also, uh, Daniel, with you know the the, the deal he made, uh, and you as you're using Universal as your international distributor, right? right. Um, are we now beyond the uh, the majors versus indies? And we're all in the, well, let's put it that way, we're all in the shit together? I think so. I, I mean, I think we, we've been beyond that. We've, we've felt that, you know, any company's true advantage comes in the quality of relationships that it has uh, everywhere, whether it's with artists, with customers, with um, suppliers, distributors. And so, I mean, I think, I you know, the music industry is, has, has been battered enough that we shouldn't be fighting about, you know, how, how we carve up a, a pie that's shrinking, we should be figuring out ways to grow the pie. And so more of our issues are, we, ha we have more issues in common with majors than we, uh, than we have issues where we're at odds. And so, uh, you know, we certainly enjoy the relationship with Universal. We think it, you know, for a label like ours, it gives us the ability to maintain an independent spirit and the flexibility and do things that, uh, that we, we would do or any indie would do, but yet still have the the representation and the great distribution power that that they bring. So it's it's been a, a healthy relationship and one that we're proud of. What did you t what did you take from your relationship with EMI aside from the money? <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh God. Um, I mean, we I, you know I think have to think about that for a second. I mean, there a lot of there are a lot of structural things that are much much larger company have that we never had systems and so forth that we never had and I think um, some of those things especially you know we were never a very how can I put it we were never very budget orientated company you know the, uh, we were a survival orientated company you know that was the thing do we survive or not it wasn't like how much profit are we going to make and um, I think the, the point and then the EMI obviously it's a very different model you know it's about how much profit you can make and how you budget and Cost and I, and I think I'm taking we're, we're taking some of that, especially in the kind of climate we're in now. Some of that experience has been very useful. So well, s someone told me that you were kind of let's put it to put it mildly, kind of annoyed by the reporting, the, the financial reporting structure of EMI, which you know you never had to deal with pr previously. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, it wasn't specific. I wasn't really annoyed by the financial reporting because that's one of the things that I knew we were going to have to do. You know, and there's pointless being annoyed by something when you know you, get, you go into a situation knowing you're going to have to. But there were elements of bureaucracy which are not particular to EMI, to any large company that I found very frustrating there. And you had to get approval from a lot of people to do almost anything. And that 
It wasn't like that at the beginning, but in the last couple of years. And I suppose that's one of the reasons that I felt I wasn't, I didn't have, I needed to be able to respond quickly to things and be flexible about things. I think that was one of the reasons that uh, EMI and uh, me and EMI jointly agreed that we would work in a different way. Between us, will Just they? Just you and me? Yeah, will they survive? Yeah, maybe. The survive? By the end of this year, will, it's very hard will there still I mean be an EMI? It depends what you mean by survive. Will, well, they will there still be an EMI by the end of this year? I'm sure there'll be an EMI, yeah. Whether I have no idea what, in what context that will be. Mm -hmm. They're doing pretty well at the moment, actually. They still have a minority stake in your, in your company? Yeah. They? yeah. How, how much? Uh, minority stake, as you said. <laughs> 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 but um, they ca they have th th there aren't any circumstances under which they can control it. Mm -hmm. okay, so you're really the, you're the master on board. Yeah. The gaffer. The gaffer. The I'm gaffer. The I'm the gaffer. Call me gaffer and get your hair cut. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're sitting, Glenn, both at the RIA and A2IM, the Independent Labels uh, Organization. Isn't that a bit, you know, schizophrenic as a in terms of uh, philosophy, attitude, and, and so on? N not really. Um, in fact, I think, you know, it's been helpful um, to, to see both perspectives. And as I said earlier, I, I think most of the time the issues are in common these days. I mean, we're fighting some of the, the, the major problems that both organizations are, are dealing with are the same. And so we work much more in cooperation uh, than, you know, where we're, we have any, any disagreement. So uh, it's been useful. It's been very useful to be um, in both organizations. And in particular, um, when I'm working with the RIAA, it feels uh, having the, the knowledge of what the indie community thinks through A2IM is very useful. Because it's not just Concord that, that I, can, uh, the, the, the I, can, I can be a voice for more than just Concord. Uh, within the RIA, and that's I found that to be very useful. So uh, I think it's it's a happy coexistence. Mm -hmm. Daniel, you t you told me uh, that you were rejoining AIM after being one of the the founders of AIM mm -hmm. in the in the UK. Um, the whole uh, move indie movement that had took place in the, in the past ten years or so. What are the what what do you think are the benefits for uh, for the is it is a sense of belonging to a a community, or is there more to it? Oh, I mean, there's a nice feeling of community, but I think there's much more to it than that. I think, I mean, one of the, th you know, one of the things where I do agree with you that, you know, basically we're fighting, we're all label companies, whatever their ownership or whatever, all basically facing a lot of the same problems, and, you know, we're f we should, we're facing the outside world, we shouldn't be eating each other up. But there are c occasions when I think it's very important for independent labels to, to work together to lobby, to for collective bargaining reasons, for you know, with like with with you know the MTVs of this world or the Spotify's of this world, and I think it's very you know where we, where the sm much smaller labels don't have the power of the, indi the of the majors. I think that's really really important that the the lobbying bodies like AIM or whatever they are in any particular territory are, are that's a really important for the for the survival of the independence. I think otherwise they could easily be just crushed by the this huge uh, kind of especially the digital world where where it's a minefield for a lot of people who don't, you know, to, where, you know, so to have those repre rep people representing us and making sure that the independent labels are properly, have a voice within the industry, I think that's extremely important. Jen? Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with that. I mean, and I think, uh, I mean, we certainly, uh, with A2IM, I mean, we, uh, we, I think we try to bring that voice not only to uh, independent settings, but also within the RIAA. And, uh, I know Rich Bengloff, who, who runs A2IM uh, so well for us, um, uh, has regular interaction with the RIA. So they're, they're, you know, there's, it's a very healthy relationship right now, I would say. And I think a lot of the issues that we maybe experienced in the past are, are behind us, and I would say more often than not, it's cooperative. But it's important that Indies have a voice and have a, you know, a strong advocate in, in each territory. And uh, so I, I, I agree with that. Okay, we have five minutes for questions from the audience. Uh, please raise your hand and uh, hopefully there will be a microphone somewhere. Uh, did you, no? Did you do? No questions? Really? Really? Okay, well, I'll ask questions then. Uh, <laughs> no, to you, well. Um, the, the um, w one of the 
the key changes that you know Daniel alluded to was that it's the streams of revenues mm -hmm. compared to 30 years ago. You've tapped into far many more streams, except that you know they might be smaller. Um, do you think that the, the ecosystem at the moment is, is balanced enough to allow the survival of the fittest, or it is it, it ain't gonna work because the revenues are you know shrinking and and the digital world is not picking up enough? Are you you know in other words, are you optimistic about the the future? Um, and I'm, the I'm I have to be. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I've just, I've decided to start a record company in 2010. Mm -hmm. If I'm not optimistic about the future, then what, you know, what am I doing? I'm, I'm very optimistic about the future of music. I think there's some um, unbelievably good artists around, very young. The artists are getting younger and younger, which means that the audience is going to get younger and younger. Um, I, I, you know, as it stands now, no, it's not really. The balance isn't quite right, but I think. We have to make sure that we move it in a in the right direction, you know. I, and in that time, we have to figure out how to survive. <laughs> but it, I'm optimistic, yeah. I'm optimistic because I think the music is great. And as long as there are people making great music, and there are people who want to listen to it and consume it in some way. We've got a we've got a somewhere to start. I've got a platform to, to start from, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. I think that um, the uh, it, it's it's difficult to see how things are going to evolve and and where we reach an inflection point where the business turns around and we actually see growth again, but that will come. And uh, so not only you know, do we continue to, uh, to try to make the very best music and work with you know, great artists and, and uh, create, but um, we're also, we, we advocate for investment. And because I think this is a time where you know, we have obviously been buying catalogs and I think you know, there's legacies there that are important to protect and to promote and also it's good business because I think this is the moment where you have so many people fleeing and running from the, the, uh, the music business. I, I, I think if you believe in, in the future of music itself that you, know, you can also invest in the past and so we've been on both levels thinking that over the long term this will be a very, very smart move. And do you think that the artists themselves have understood that the paradigm of the music industry has changed fundamentally from where it was 10, 15 years ago? in their you, your discussions with them? Definitely the new artists, the younger artists have a, a very clear idea, a very clear gri grasp of what's going on. Some of the more established artists who've been going for 15, 20 years mm -hmm. are slowly coming around and understanding. But the younger artists completely understand because they've been part of the environment that has changed the music. You know, the, old, the older musicians haven't you know, been a bit distant from it, but they're part of that you know, the younger kids are all part of that community. So, uh, yeah, they understand completely and very... Mm -hmm. Some of the things that you would be find difficult talking to more established artists about, it's just no part of normal conversation with a, with, with a new artist. But then as a label, what can you bring them? I think we bring them... Well, what I like to think we bring them is to give them, give them the time and space and the feedback to be creative, to create, to create and not, you know... I think I think you know I started Mute as an artist who wanted to put a record out. I didn't start as a label, so I know I'm very supportive of artists who want to just put their own music out. But I also know that there comes a point where it becomes very difficult to you know to do all the things to run a label and be on the road and be in the studio and make sure that you're getting paid and you know. <coughs> so we provide a structure for people to work in. Part of it's creative structure, some of it's uh, a, a business structure. Um, and hopefully we can give them some advice, they can take it or leave it, but, uh, and we help promote and market and those things, that's the kind of things we bring. Talking about advice, the next panel, which will start shortly, uh, is called uh, the Ten Commandments uh, for Running Successfully a, a Label. Uh, based on your experience and you know, the, the career that you've had, what would be, you know, not necessarily commandments, but what would be the advices, the tips that you could give to someone in 2010 or 2011 who says, you know, I'd like to be in the music industry, I'd like to have a label? Glenn? I, I would say the, the number one tip I would give is, is remember that it's, um, there's two sides to the business, that there's a customer and an artist, and I think we as, a, as an industry for a long time have been um, 
very artist-centric, and that's a great thing. You know, we focused on artists. It's all about discovering artists, discovering music. It's, it's what we all love, and, and so it's very natural. Um, and it's not that you shouldn't focus on the artists, but we have to remember the other side of the equation, which is there's a customer. And um, so it's, it's providing that service. You know, what, what we do, and we may find many different ways to do it, but what we do is we ultimately connect the artist's message to that customer. And so my tip would be never forget that, never lose sight of that, never focus just on the one side, and, and make sure that you're finding all those innovative ways to, to put the two together. Daniel? Well, I think that, first of all, I agree with you. That's a, very, that's a very important thing, is the connection between the two. That's what it's about. It's not just sitting in your room making music. It's about how, you, how the audience, customers, whatever you want to call them, you know, respond. And, and, you, know, I th the other, and uh, you know, I think the industry is generally like not just the music industry, but a lot of industries have kind of dictated how people want to consume things. Now people, now the audience dictates how they want to consume things. And if you don't respond to that, you're in real trouble. I mean, there's some, there are quite a few commandments. I'm not going through, but I think one of the ones, one of the things that I've found, and it's worked for me, that's all I can say, is that if you f when you want to work with people, whether it's artists, whether it's um, people, you know, your, your, your employees, whether it's distributors, whether it's freelancers, I found that it's very easy to get pissed off very quickly and just keep chopping and changing. I, s um, I would recommend people find people they trust, p find people they like, and work with them and develop them along your jointly develop yourselves and form long term relationships with people who will deliver. And I think if you keep chopping and changing, I think you know you'll eventually get chopped and changed. If you if you if you stick with people you trust you know help them let them help you I think that really works as that's always worked as a model for me. Well, don't chop and change would be a nice name for a label. Yeah. <laughs> well, on those uh, words of wisdom, um, unfortunately the t time is over for this session. But uh, I wanted to very warmly thank Glenn Barrows and Daniel Miller. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thanks for inviting us.